Hello, and welcome to Chapter 5 of our read-through of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. I'm Jem, the reader at St John the Baptist Parish Church in Beeston. And if you haven't read this chapter, scurry away and read it. The rest of us will wait for you. You need to read from, because the game of seek, Hide and Seek was still going on, it took Edmund and Lucy some time to find the others, and read down to... Peter held the door closed but did not shut it, for, of course, he remembered, as every sensible person does, that you should never, never shut yourself up in a wardrobe. <clears throat> so, as with previous episodes, I'd like to talk about a few things that particularly struck me and made me think uh, in this chapter. Uh, I won't be giving a line-by-line line or a page-by-page page account of the meaning of the novel, but rather reflecting on, on bits and bobs uh, that seem most significant. <clears throat> in this chapter, then... Edmund and Lucy come out of Narnia, and Lucy is expecting Edmund to uh, to validate everything she's been saying about this magical world, and he decides not to, and indeed to lie about it and say that they've just been playing a game. This causes Peter and Susan to become even more worried about Lucy, and they go to see the professor uh, and ask him what they should do, and he has a rather surprising response to them, suggesting that in fact it is possible that there is a magical world that's visited through a wardrobe, uh, and posing them some questions before muttering to himself uh, what they teach them in these schools and why can't they apply logic to things. So there are several things here and several points that are touched on that stretch back into the previous chapters and forward into, <clears throat> into the subsequent chapters. Um, perhaps most obviously, we, we have the chapter beginning with another act of small betrayal by Edmund. What's all this all about, Ed? said Peter. Now we come to one of the nastiest things in this story. Up to that moment, Edmund had been feeling sick and sulky and annoyed with Lucy for being right, but he hadn't made up his mind what to do. When Peter suddenly asked him the question, he decided all at once to do the meanest and most spiteful thing he could think of. He decided to let Lucy down. Tell us, Ed, said Susan. And Edmund gave a very superior look, as if he were far older than Lucy. There was really only a year's difference. And then a little snigger and said, Oh yes, Lucy and I have been playing pretending that all her story about a country in the wardrobe is true. Just for fun, of course. There's nothing there, really. Poor Lucy gave Edmund one look and rushed out of the room. Edmund, who was becoming a nastier person every minute, thought, th thought that he had scored a great success and went on at once to say, There she goes again. What's the matter with her? That's the worst of these young kids. They always... So, as I've suggested, we can see the development of, of Edmund's psyche and moral character, and it's not a very pleasing development, um, the, through these chapters. When he comes to betray his family, as he will in a couple of chapters, it doesn't come out of the blue. There is a, a chain of logic to it. There is a, um, a series of circumstances in which Edmund gets himself sort of deeper and deeper uh, into moral problems. And it's quite striking that the form that this act takes, the nastiest and most spiteful thing, as the, as the text uh, says, the form that this takes is betrayal. He's specifically in a, um, in a sort of bond with someone. Lucy regards him as uh, all in it together, as she says at the end of the, of the previous chapter, and he decides to essentially push her out uh, and continue to say that, that it's not true. So he lies, but also he betrays her. Why does he betray her? We're told that he's particularly annoyed at her for being right and that it's going to embarrass him and make him feel bad to admit in public uh, that he's been wrong and she's been right. Why would that embarrass and annoy him? Because unlike Peter and Susan, he hasn't been concerned about Lucy and worried that she's apparently lying or, or, or fantasising uh, unhealthily. But he's seen her claim about this magical world as a sign of weakness and has been sort of mocking and jeering at her all the way through. So the, the reason for this moral lapse is embedded in his previous moral lapse. It doesn't simply, he doesn't decide to be motivelessly nasty to her at this point, but he's in a position where he has to either do something he doesn't want to do, admit that she's right and he's been wrong, or he has to go the next stage further into his sort of moral flaw and, and betray her in, in a new way. And so I, I think, as I've suggested, that there is a, there's a gradualism to... Edmund's development into uh, into his final betrayal. But there's also a logic to it. It does actually make sense that having having picked on Lucy, he'd have to make a greater act of virtue here than he would be if he would have been nicer to her earlier. It, it would have been it would have been a smaller investment of good, so to speak, to, to just be nice to her and not pick on her and not see, you know, there's a chance to exert power over her. But having done so, he's now in a position where he'd have to buy himself out 
with a greater level of generousness and unselfishness. And he chooses not to do so. He chooses to go further into it. Um, so Edmund's moral psychology, as, as I've suggested, is, is I think one of the interesting parts of the book. It's both Lewis being, being coherent about the character, but also developing a line of moral conduct uh, in a way that is relatively realistic, I think, and, and relatively shows us the way in which s small lapses and small flaws can, can grow on a character uh, and can lead them into, into greater flaws. So when Peter and Susan go to see the professor and explain why they're worried about Lucy and what's going on, he surprises them very much by saying, and how do you know, he asked, that your sister's story is not true? Oh, but, began Susan and then stopped. Anyone could see from the old man's face that he was perfectly serious, etc., etc. Um, and he says, is Lucy usually truthful? And they say, yes, usually Lucy is more truthful than Edmund. Um, uh... But then, said Susan, and stopped. She had never dreamed that a grown-up would talk like the professor, and she didn't know what to think. Logic, said the professor half to himself. Why do they teach logic at these schools? There are only three possibilities. Either your sister is telling lies, or she is mad, or she is telling the truth. You know she doesn't tell lies. It is obvious that she is not mad. He said earlier that you only have to sort of talk to her and see the way she behaves to know she's not uh, deranged. From that moment, then, and unless any further evidence turns up, we must assume that she is telling the truth. Susan looked at him very hard and was quite sure from the expression on his face that he was not making fun of them. But how could it be true, sir, said Peter. Why do you say that? asked the professor. Well, for one thing, said Peter, if it was real, why doesn't everyone find this country every time they go to the wardrobe? And, and he explains his problem with this, this theory. The professor has brought out one of Lewis's most famous theological arguments. Um, in this situation, uh, uh, a piece of reasoning that's often known as Lewis's trilemma, although, in fact, it wasn't Lewis that first phrased it. Um, but Lewis very famously used this argument um, about Jesus Christ in mere Christianity. To quote, I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic, on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make up your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronising nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now, it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend. And consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was, and is, God. Now, this is, a, as I say, a very famous argument. It's one that is often quoted by fans of Lewis. It has not always found favour with uh, theologians or, or apologists. There are a few, I think, obvious weaknesses. Most famously, that Jesus' claims are trans uh, claims as this trilemma takes them are transmitted via the Gospels, and the Gospels have been edited and written uh, and transmitted for for centuries and centuries. Um, we have not actually met Jesus and and had these claims put to us. So it's possible that other people have said things about him that he didn't say. There are also other elements of the gospel which might cast doubt on this, such as the messianic secret, the fact that Jesus seems at pains at various points to prevent people either saying that he is the Messiah and the awaited son of David, or from, from spreading that message. From, from He seems keen to prevent other people from saying that uh, more generally. Um, but anyway, as, a, as, a, as an, an attitude and as an approach to the, uh, the apparent claims that people put forward having read the Gospels. This is one of Lewis's classic reference, the Lewis trilemma. And it's interesting and perhaps amusing that he puts it in the mouth of the professor in this story about uh, the magical world of Narnia. It's also interesting that he, whilst writing a book that is clearly based upon the biblical accounts of the, the passion of, of Christ, also adds, if you like, a character who does a bit of theology uh, on the on the life of Christ. Uh, we'll discuss later on 
how much this novel is not simply a retelling of particular passion narratives, but it blends things, um, it synthesizes things, it cuts things out, it introduces things. Um, Lewis is, is by no means a, a simple-minded writer, but it's, it's striking that there is actually a character who is alongside this narrative, sort of doing apologetic, um, sort of doing philosophical defences of the possibility of Narnia, even in a story in which Narnia is, is apparently there. It also struck me, and I'd like to pause on this, that he says, logic, why don't they teach them logic? It's one of Lewis's uh, concerns, and a concern of other thinkers at the time, particularly, and I've obviously said this before, um, for writers in the evangelical tradition, but writers in Christianity more generally, that Christianity is reasonable. Reasonable in, in, the, in the, if you like, technical sense that it is subject to reason. It's not vague and misty uh, and an abrogation of our duty to, to think uh, and to reason about the world. Um, the, the thing that the professor says, it strikes me when it comes to them, is not, oh, the world's very strange and mysterious, we don't really know anything about it, and, you know, the Loch Ness Monster probably exists, the fairies probably exist, and Narnia probably exists. He encourages them to apply reason and logic specifically and rationally. Uh, Lewis, like other apologists, believes that Christianity is, is not only coherent, it actually stands to the reason. If you apply reason and logic to it, it stands up, and the other options, if you like, the critiques of it, don't stand up. Um, and this reminded me, of this insistence on, on reason, reminded me of uh, another famous Christian apologist and uh, novel writer, G.K. Chesterton, who famously wrote the, the Father Brown stories. The very first of these, published in 1910 called The Blue Cross, ends with a passage in which Father Brown, the little detective priest, and Flambeau, the, the famous French villain, are sitting uh, in, a, in a lonely place um, and they're discussing the sky and the stars. And there's, a, there's a, an inspector of police who's overhearing them because he knows that Father Brown is carrying, or he thinks Father Brown's carrying, a very valuable a silver cross inlaid with jewels, and he knows the flambeau is after this and might hurt Father Brown and tell me to get it. The first he heard was the tale of one of... Oh, I should... Sorry, I should point out this point. Flambeau and Father Brown are both dressed as priests. Flambeau has, has disguised himself as a priest as a way of trying to get this, um, this piece of religious artwork. The first he heard was the tale of one of Father Brown's sentences, which ended, What they really meant in the Middle Ages by the heavens being incorruptible. The taller priest that's Flambeau, nodded his bowed head and said, Ah, yes, these modern infidels appeal to their reason, but who can look at those millions of worlds and not feel that there may well be wonderful universes above us where reason is utterly unreasonable? No, said the other priest, reason is always reasonable, even in the last limbo, in the last borderland of things. I know that people charge the church with lowering reason, but it is just the other way. Alone on earth, the church makes reason really supreme. Alone on earth, the church affirms that God himself is bound by reason. The other priest raised his austere face to the spangled sky and said, Yet who knows if in that infinite universe, only infinite physically, said the little priest, sh sh turning sharply in his seat, not infinite in the sense of escaping from the laws of truth. Now, well, whilst what the story calls this mild metaphysical gossip with, with two old parsons is going on, there's something essential in the plot of the story, and Father Brown later explains to Flambeau, this is the point at which Flambeau makes his most fatal error in his disguise, because Flambeau said, how, how did you know it? I wasn't a priest? How did you know I was a, a robber? Um, and Father Brown says, it's very simple, you attacked reason, his bad theology. Uh, now, both Chesterton and Lewis clearly saw reason and logic as not inimical to Christian faith, which was one of the charges, of course, that was, that was brought against Christian faith in the early 20th century coming off the back of uh, the confusion and debates over things like geology and Darwinism and, indeed, uh, personal morality. The typical charge, perhaps, and we see this today, indeed, the typical charge was that Christianity is irrational, unscientific, unlogical. It was given a particularly sharp edge by the fact that one of the major critiques of Christianity in the early 20th century, of course, came from Marxism which claimed to be a, a science of history, a scientific, uh, entirely reasonable and entirely logical and rational way of looking at the world. And its critique of Christianity was that Christianity mystified, it vagued things up, um, it obscured the relationships between power and people and property and the way history actually worked, and it 
cast uh, a vast moth-eaten musical brocade, to borrow Philip Larkin's phrase, perhaps in opposite in this situation, over what was actually there. And the the the, the counterattack from intellectuals like Chesterton and Lewis was always not that the world is more woogly than you might think, uh, or that a bit of vagueness is, is good, but that, no, that Christianity is absolutely rational and indeed is the only purely rational form of uh, metaphysic form of belief and ideology in the world. Um, so I was I was interested that Lewis embedded the trilemma in that uh, chapter, but also particularly interested that he he grounds this on logic. The professor teaches them to use logic, not to believe any old nonsense that might come their way, or indeed to become less precise in their thinking, but actually to become, when dealing with fauns and satyrs and, and witches and, and snowy realms found from a wardrobe, you must become more precise and more uh, rational and forensic in your thinking if you're going to survive them. Now, the children uh, then have another uh, uh, expedition to the wardrobe, which is going to take us into the next chapter. And this is because there, there are some visitors uh, to the professor's house and they're being shown round by Mrs McCready. This house of the professors, which even he knew so little about, was so old and famous that people from all over England used to come and ask permission to see over it. It was the sort of house that is mentioned in guidebooks and even in histories, and well it might be, for all manner of stories were told about it, some of them even stranger than the one I am telling you now. And when parties of sightseers arrived and asked to see the house, the professor always gave them permission, and Mrs McCready, the housekeeper, showed them round, telling them about the pictures and the armour and the rare books in the library. Mrs McCready was not fond of children, and did not like to be interrupted when she was telling visitors all the things she knew. She had said to Susan and Peter almost on the first morning, along with the many other good instructions, and please remember you are to keep out of the way whenever I'm taking a party over the house. In this particular case, uh, the children see Mrs McCready bringing a, a party of people, and they dodge out the way. Sharp's the word, said Peter, and all four made off through the door at the far end of the room. But when they had got out into the green room and beyond it into the library, they suddenly heard voices ahead of them and realised that Mrs McCready must be bringing her party of sightseers up the back stairs instead of up the front stairs as they had expected. And after that, whether it was that they lost their heads or that Mrs McCready was trying to catch them or that some magic in the house had come to life and was chasing them into Narnia, they seem to find themselves being followed everywhere and eventually they go into the room where the wardrobe is and they go through the wardrobe. Now this is an excuse for me to return to a theme that I've been suggesting in previous episodes, the gothic quality of this novel. I've argued that it's a war novel, I've argued that it's a novel about moral psychology, but I'm convinced it's also a gothic novel. We have here a, a big rambling house full of strange stories that doesn't seem to fit together quite logically. They go through passageways that they that they think will take them out of her path, but actually she's on the other side and then they go elsewhere and actually the, the spatial dynamics of the house don't seem to be working. Uh, P.S. Note to fans of Hogwarts, of course, Hogwarts literally does that. It rearranges itself um, as you're moving through it. So we've got this big old house and all these strange things inside it. And we've got a housekeeper. Housekeepers don't do well in Gothic fiction, do they? They're not, they're not popular characters. Um, the, the, the thing that sprang to my mind, I'm afraid, was Mrs Danvers in Rebecca, um, where there's another uh, young woman who is overawed by a housekeeper who basically wants to, to keep the house as a museum only to be told stories about the past and for no new life to come into it. Or perhaps we think about the wolves of Willoughby Chase, um, where there is a, a housekeeper. She ends terribly badly, doesn't she? I think she end, ends, up, ends up being blown up on a sort of steam-powered lawnmower snow shovel, if I recall. It's terribly bad. Uh, and we might think of the borrowers, where, again, the, the, uh, the villain is a housekeeper who doesn't believe in the, in the magical goings-on and wants to, sort of, uh, wants to sort of benefit from being in charge of the house. I think the image here is, as I've suggested, someone who is who is taking care of the remnant, someone who is treating the house as history, as a shell, as a museum to be preserved very strongly in that case, in the case of Mrs Danvers, of course, because she wants to keep Rebecca's memory there um, rather than the second Mrs De Winter coming and living there. And the house subverts that. The house wants new life to happen. The house wants uh, you know, th things to, to come alive, not unlike the way in which... The, the winter that rules over Narnia is going to be disrupted. I don't mean to slander Mrs McCready by saying she's as bad as the White Witch, but on both sides of the wardrobe we have this female figure who's sort of strict and wants the children um, to, to behave in sort of unchildren-like ways and is trying to keep things uh, stayed and um, frozen in time, we might say. 
Um, and the house is going to subvert that, and the children are going to subvert that. So next chapter is Into the Forest. You should read from, I wish the MacReady would hurry up and take all these people away, said Susan presently. I'm getting horribly cramped. All the way to Great Scott, said Peter. I hadn't thought of that. And no chance of dinner either, said Edmund. As I've said before, I'd really like to know your thoughts about this chapter. Um, so do leave some in the comments, please. And I'll see you next time.